Section 39 of The Golden Web by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter 18. Winifred is Trapped. Dean followed his guide up two flights of stairs. On the landing of the third, she paused. I don't usually interfere with the comings and goings of my lodger, she said. They pay for their rooms. That's all I ask. You see the door opposite you? Yes, Dean answered quickly. That room is tenanted by a young woman who calls herself Montague, but she received letters under the name of Sinclair. She had a visitor this afternoon who might be the young person of whom you were in search. You had better go in and see. Dean was across the landing in a moment. He tapped sharply upon the door. There was no answer. He tried the handle. The door was locked. Open the door, he cried out, shaking it vigorously. There was no answer. To Dean the silence was ominous. He turned to the woman who stood silently by his side, with a fierce little exclamation. Where is the telephone? he demanded. Inside there, she answered. It used to be my sitting room. The door's locked, he exclaimed. I do not understand it, she admitted. Have you another key? No. He flung himself at the door tearing it half from its hinges. Another assault, and with a tearing of splinters, it fell inside. Dean stepped over it into the room, and a low cry of anger broke from his lips. The woman at his side fled, shrieking downstairs. On the floor lay Winifred Rowan, her limbs bound with cords, a gag in her mouth, her clothing all disheveled, her eyes shining with an almost painful intensity from her ashen gray face. Dean fell on his knees by her side. Winifred, he exclaimed, my God. He snatched his knife from his pocket, removed the gag from her mouth, and cut all her bonds. Her hands tried nervously to rearrange her dress over her bosom. He tore off his own coat and threw it over her. Are you badly hurt, he asked anxiously. I'm not hurt much, she answered weakly, but... But what, he demanded. She commenced to cry softly but insistently. Black fear rose up to torture him. But what, he repeated, with a sinking heart. It has gone, she murmured, crossing her hands upon her bosom. What has gone, he asked, quick. The deed, she whispered. Don't look at me like that. I couldn't help it. It was a trap, of course, to get me here, and I was a fool. The letter was from you. I ought to have known it was a forgery. I was taken unawares. She was like a mad woman. She would have torn the clothes from my body. I struggled. I called out. It was no use. She has taken it away. But you are not hurt, he exclaimed anxiously. I? No, she answered, a little vacantly. But it is gone. I was not fit to be trusted with it. I ought to have given it up to you. She was very pale, and he was afraid of her fainting. He summoned the landlady once more. She was waiting on the stairs close by. Something very serious has happened here, he said sternly. This young lady has been assaulted and robbed. I'm sure I'm very sorry, the woman declared. You can't blame any of us, though. I never heard a sound, nor more did Hilda. And I can't prevent my lodgers having visitors. We won't discuss it, Dean said sharply. But if this is Miss Montague's room... It isn't, the woman interrupted. It's my sitting room. Miss Montague has only an attic, and she came to me and said she couldn't receive a visitor there, and asked me to lend her my room for a few minutes. Dean nodded. The other rooms on this floor are unoccupied, of course, he said. Oh, it's quite easy to understand. I don't need to ask you any more questions. I don't want any more explanations. If you want to keep this out of the police court, you will do exactly as I tell you. Yes, she exclaimed eagerly, I will do anything. Send your servant for a cab, Dean said, and arrange for this young lady's dress so that I can take her home. I'll fetch her a bodice of my own, declared the woman, hurrying off. Winifred had risen to her feet and was sitting in an easy chair. She was leaning forward with her face half buried in her hands. Dean turned towards her. Winifred? She avoided his gaze. Don't, she begged. Please don't talk to me. I can't bear it. But I may say, he began. No, she interrupted almost fiercely. Please say nothing. I mean it. I cannot bear to talk. 
I cannot bear to be talked to. A little throb of anger darkened his face. She had not even common gratitude for her rescue. She had but one thought, one regret, the loss of that future of luxury to attain which she had bound herself to him. A curious anger burned in his blood. A pain which he could not analyze shook his heart. Then there came the sound of voices on the stairs, feminine voices raised in anger. The door was burst open. Ruby stood there upon the threshold, looking in upon them, her lips curved in an ugly smile of triumph, her eyes ablaze. Behind her stood the landlady, a black bodice in her hand, her forehead wrinkled in a deprecating frown. "'So you found her, have you?' Rudy exclaimed. Her face turned towards Dean, her finger outstretched to where Winifred sat, shrinking back in her chair. "'Thieves, both of you, thieves, thieves!' Dean pointed to Winifred's torn clothing. "'And that?' he asked. "'It was restitution,' the girl declared fiercely. "'The deed was mine. Your millions are mine. She stole it for you. Her brother was a murderer for you. How do you think the story will look in the newspapers, huh?' inciting to murder and theft isn't that a crime swindlers both of you she cried passionately you have kept me a beggar huh she cried to winifred while you clad your poor body in silks and laces covered yourself with jewels and made him marry you and i was to starve to starve or worse well we'll see we'll see young lady dean said calmly you are being led away by your imagination you have taken a paper away from miss rowan which you think is going to turn out a sort of El Dorado. It isn't worth the paper it's written on. It's a lie, the girl shrieked. I've taken it to lawyers. It is genuine. They all say so. Dean almost lifted Winifred from her chair. That remains to be seen, he declared. In any case, it was stolen, she cried. That young woman there has got to say how it came into her possession and what she meant by going around with it sewn into her bodice. Oh, you needn't try to dupe me, she cried. I want my money. God knows how I want it. And I mean to make her suffer, too, she added, pointing to Winifred. She's a thief. She lived in luxury while I've starved. She's worn the clothes of a princess while I've gone in rags. But she'll pay. My God, she shall pay. Dean, with Winifred by his side, had reached the door. I'm afraid, he said, turning to the girl, who was still regarding them with breathless anger, that you have let your imagination run away with you a good deal. A dose of the law courts will do you no harm. If you care for a word of warning from me, you can have it. But don't build your hopes too much upon that paper. We shall see, she cried fiercely. You can't frighten me. If the paper is of no value, why did she steal it? Why did she carry it sewn into her clothes? If you... She hesitated for a moment. Her eyes rested upon Dean. Her expression softened. If you want to make terms, she began. He turned away. Come, Winifred, he said. In the cab, they scarcely spoke. She had the air of a person utterly exhausted, indifferent to anything that might happen. Tell me, he asked, soon after they started, what made you go to that house? The letter from you, she answered. I was a fool, of course, but I went. It doesn't matter, does it? I suppose not, he answered. The despair in her face nerved him to further speech. I'm afraid, he said, that you are worrying about that deed, or rather the loss of it. I am sorry that I came too late, but it couldn't be helped. You did all that you could, I am sure of that. Of course, she interposed impatiently, and I have failed. That is the end of it. He looked out of the window, looked with stern, unseeing eyes upon the passing people. The sun had ceased to shine. His heart was heavy as lead. He seemed suddenly to realize the reason of her dejection. She believed in the deed. She believed that he was indeed a pauper. It was for the wreck of her hopes that she was lamenting. The rest went for nothing. He was a poor man, no longer of any interest to her. His manner unconsciously stiffened as the thought came rushing home to him. He drew away from her, and he remained silent until the cab stopped in front of her hotel. She stepped out quickly and almost ran across the pavement. Tomorrow, she said, holding out her hand, as though to prevent his following. He bowed and turned away. Her dishabille was without a doubt an embarrassment. Already he was beginning to find excuses for her. Nevertheless, 
he watched the slim, swaying figure as the doors closed upon her with something of apprehension. Was it ominous that she should pass away without a backward glance? Was she indeed nothing but an adventuress, deprived of her prey? He paid the cab and walked slowly back to his rooms. His solicitor had already rung up. Two of his directors were waiting to see him. A reporter buttonholed him upon the pavement. From all of which things Dean knew that Ruby Sinclair had lost no time, that the first note of battle had been sounded. End of section thirty nine.